Turner Commercial, scene 1A, take one, marker. Good evening, America. In the coming election, you have an extremely important decision to make. With your vote, you may choose to continue to overextend our military presence throughout the world, or choose to utilize American resources to fix problems here in America. If elected your president, I will withdraw all military presence from all foreign soil. I will then redirect 50% of our $420 billion annual military budget to fix health care, social security, education, and homeland defense. I think you'll agree that our extremely aggressive behavior has seriously eroded our ability to work in the world community as an equal member of the world community. America can no longer be the world's self-appointed policeman. If you elect me, I will take the savings from our defense budget. I will create new jobs. I will fund research for new energy development. And I will stop the dependency on foreign oil and lay the foundation for a better, stronger America. The world population is growing rapidly, but the U.S. population and GDP are shrinking in relation to the rest of the world. We simply can no longer sustain our current military presence. Something has to be done. Our greatest resource isn't our money. It is the lives of the men and women of the American Armed Forces. How many more American lives must be lost because of our interference in the internal affairs of other countries? Vote for me and I will bring our servicemen and women home, home to a better, stronger America, an America that will again be respected. Could this actually happen? What if America withdrew its military presence from around the world? While the US is one of the most indebted countries, their military budget is larger by two-thirds than Russia, China and all other potential US enemies combined. How much can America spend? And for how long? As the world is adding about a billion people every decade, most traditional US allies are turning their backs on the once indispensable superpower. So, if one day a presidential candidate advocated a complete withdrawal from all foreign countries, would the Americans vote him in? Recent polls show that most Americans would like to see their budget spent on deficit reduction, medical care, or simply not spent at all and returned to the taxpayers. Would this be the right thing to do? And what about the other countries? What would happen to them? What would the world be like once America is gone? Every time, somewhere in the world, something goes wrong, the Americans have their finger in there. We have got the feeling that they only want, want to improve their economy. How the US acts is not the right way. Most of the time it's too late, it's too brutal, somehow it's respectless, really respectless. If the United States were to draw all their military from the rest of the world, there would be a global celebration. When you hear people, particularly in Europe, condemning the United States as if it were an evil empire, you can't help but smile because it's not that long ago that there really was an evil empire menacing Western Europe. I mean, we were the savior of, of Europe. We stood up against the Soviet Union. It doesn't cause them any philosophical pain whatsoever to take your protection and badmouth you. Yes, Americans saved Europe, absolutely. 
and the French are very th grateful for that. But it's been 60 years. At the present time, the European Union is the only entity on Earth that surpasses the United States as an economic power. Germany, France and the UK are some of the largest armament exporters to the world. Despite all the peace and prosperity, there are still almost 100,000 American troops in Europe, scattered in hundreds of bases hosted by the 27 American allies. So should one day the US pull out, is the United Europe ready to care for their continent? During the early 90s, the country of Yugoslavia was falling apart. Over two million people were forced to relocate and 250,000 lost their lives in the biggest genocide since World War II. Again, each side is charging the other with atrocities. The facts are unclear, but some terrible things were done in the final hours. Yeah. Bosnia was one of the six provinces that once made the country of Yugoslavia. By 1991, two of these provinces, Slovenia and Croatia, broke off to become independent countries. Shortly afterwards, some of the Bosnians also wanted to become independent, but unlike Croatia and Slovenia, Bosnia was very ethnically mixed between Orthodox Serbs, Muslim Bosnians and some Croats. While most Muslim Bosnians wanted independence, the Orthodox Serbs wanted to remain part of Yugoslavia, sparking a civil war that lasted for four years. As the Belgrade government was no longer trusted to be efficient and impartial, small gangs of ultra-nationalist Bosnians, Serbs and Croats simply decided to clean out their townships of other ethnicities. Most of the time, each undesired family was given one warning and asked to move. Thousands of them moved. Others didn't. Lacking any overarching authority, the cycle of inter-ethnic murder and retaliation became unstoppable. Soon, the once tolerant majority that still considered themselves Yugoslavs became non-existent. Everyone had to take a side simply trying to stay alive. Walking the streets of Sarajevo, the bombed out buildings remind you every step of the way of the atrocities committed here. Za Ameriku je mnogo značajnije šta se događa između Palestine i Izraela, u Irskoj, Severna Koreja, Irak, Iran, nego u Bosna i Hercegovina. I u krajnjem Amerika je prepustila Evropi da reši sukobe na prostoru Balkana. For the first year of the war, next to nothing was done, other than meetings and negotiations. By 1992, the French, British and Dutch sent peacekeeping troops under the United Nations command. Hello. 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 However, they were not allowed to shoot at anyone, not even in order to protect civilians. 
there were very few people in the governments uh, in Britain and France at that time who were prepared to say that Serbia was the principal aggressor. And so for that reason, I think we must look back on the 1990s as a kind of second age of appeasement, rather like the 1930s, with the difference that they were appeasing not a truly tyrannical figure uh, like Hitler, but a petty tin pot dictator in the name of Milosevic. Germany, the largest, wealthiest European nation, did not send any troops at all. Ja, also das ist eine Schulnummer zu groß für Deutschland, äh, dort groß mitzumachen. Da haben sie gar nicht die militärischen Ressourcen für. Nochmal zurück zu dem Problem, warum äh, haben die Europäer so lange gewartet, bis äh, Millionen von Menschen ermordet waren in Bosnien. Zu die Interessen der einzelnen Länder ist zu äh, egoistisch. Es ist kein äh, gemeinsames Sprachrohr da. Jeder äh, sagt seine Meinung und die sind sehr unterschiedlich. And as for the Americans, for once, they were not doing anything either. Concerned with containing Saddam Hussein, the Washington consensus was that Europe will handle it. They were not facing Hitler or Stalin, but a civil war in a very small Balkan country. By 1995, the atrocities were getting worse and worse. In the summer of that year, the Serbs mobilized hundreds of soldiers in order to round up and eliminate the Muslim civilians in the town of Srebrenica. Hours before the Serbs arrived, most men tried to escape in the woods, while the women and children stayed behind. Among them, Ivandic Fedila, whose son decided to flee. On me je poljubio i dok me je ljubio drhtala mu brada i govorio mi ne ne mama nemoj se brinuti za meni ne ne mama nemoj da plačiš ako se meni nešto desi. To su bile posljednje riječi mog sina a to je bilo 11. jula utorak 2 sata popodni kad sam ušla u kamp. The camp was a former battery factory. It was also the headquarters of the Dutch soldiers sent as peacekeepers. The Bosnian refugees thought they were running to a place of safety. They had no idea that the Dutch soldiers had surrendered to the Serb forces. Some Serbian soldiers even wore Dutch uniforms, luring the refugees into a false sense of security. Čuli su se te noći užasni krikovi. Bila je mukla tišina i najedan put užasni krikovi i sve se digne na noge. A šta se dešava? Dolazili su holandski vojnici i vojnici četnici koji su bili obučeni u uniformi holandski vojnika. Narod su da samo sjedi, da sjedi, da ne bude na nogama. From a place of refuge, the battery factory became a death chamber. As the Dutch peacekeeping troops stood by, the Serbs murdered 8,000 Bosnians. Among the dead, were Fadilla's husband and son, who were buried in a mass grave across the street. Their remains have yet to be identified. Clinton is a good man, but I am a man of love. For the time of his mandate, my child was not lost. He was probably a man of God. I did not find him in his head. He was not identified in his head. The European people, the European governments, really waited a little bit too long. And I think if the uh, Americans wouldn't have come, the killing would have, you know, gone on, go on and on. The expectation of the people of Bosnia and Croatia was that someone strong will come and save them. 
I svi smo gledali, uprli oču tu Ameriku. Šta Amerika odluči, to će biti. Ja puno vjerovala, nisam ni Americi, ni Evropi. They were begging the French, they were begging the Europeans to go in and help them out. And I think in that case, yes, we definitely should have gone in, we should have gone in sooner. I'm glad we did go in and I think we should have done more. In 1995, the United States finally intervened. After a series of bombing raids and the deployment of thousands of American troops, all Bosnian parties agreed to a ceasefire. In Dayton, in the United States, three presidents signed up to a peace agreement. That peace agreement was devised to give you a chance to live a life free of fear, to be able to grow up in a country where its citizens have the choice to do as they wish. One of the lessons of 20th century history is that ethnically mixed societies can explode. The Balkans is a synonym for non-stability <laughs> and it has been that forever and it will, I think, remain for quite a long time still. Europe, in fact, has a tendency to keep ethnic minorities as ethnic minorities. And it's no longer a problem that's just confined to the Balkans. In many ways, it's a general European problem that's getting more serious as more and more Muslims immigrate uh, into the European Union and find themselves living in what are effectively ghettos. It seems to me that Bosnia may not just be a remnant of Europe's past, it may conceivably foreshadow a future for the whole of Europe, a future of ethnic and even religious conflict that I find frankly terrifying. So what if another ethnic conflict was to erupt again? Actually, it did. Four years later, in 1999, Kosovo, another province of the former Yugoslavia, sought independence. Historically a Serbian province, Kosovo had an 89% Albanian language population, while the Serbs only made up the remaining one-tenth. Hoping for a Serbian revival, President Slobodan Milosevic shut down all Albanian language newspapers and universities. What was happening in the region was mainly the responsibility of Serbia policy and it was a fight for territories, you know, and you cannot, it's very hard to occupy territories with diplomatic means. You have to use force, and Milosevic used force. But there was a strong opposition to war here. And it was not only in the sense that we were protesting and so on, but it was visible in the low response to mobilization. He could not find soldiers for his armies. Faced with second-class citizenship, the Albanian Kosovars claimed their independence. This again triggered a policy of ethnic cleansing on a massive scale. This time, the United States did not wait for a European response. The US gave the Serb leaders several ultimatums. Then, the NATO forces systematically started to bomb Serbia, taking out bridges, power plants and factories. After 71 days of bombardment, the Belgrade government agreed to withdraw their forces from Kosovo. When NATO began to wage war against what was left of Yugoslavia, I was aghast because it seemed to me, for all kinds of reasons, to be a radical departure from the entire post-war order based on the United Nations Charter, because this was an intervention in the internal affairs of a sovereign state. Kosovo is a province. If I could choose, you know, I, I probably w w would choose that no one intervene in Serbia, probably. I think that we must solve our own problem. That's, that, that, that's natural. I cannot support those things. Of course, it's bombing, it's, uh, you know, it, it, many people were killed, many children were killed during the NATO bombing, you know, because of the mistakes. Well, you need mediators in some kind of conflicts. When people cannot agree on something, there is, nest, 
there is a necessi necessity for a mediator. But does this mediator has to have arms or impose? This is not a mediator. This is solution bringing party. And this is not something that is appreciated by any, any side. And when you look at this region, especially the Balkans, you see that what we have now is that we have no more conflicts because of the presence of the mediator, armed mediator, peacekeepers as they call themselves. But in fact, if they leave, the conflict is not solved. We are in Kosovo for the same reason you were here. Some things are worth fighting for. A future not dominated by massive killing of innocent civilians because of the ethnic or racial heritage they were born with or the way they worship God. Military intervention by the United States was most probably an attempt not to repeat the same mistakes and go into the long, like three and a half, four years, war on the territory of Kosovo, but to stop it in time. I and those who were critical of President Clinton and indeed of Prime Minister Blair were actually wrong. This was the right thing to do. Uh, the imperialism of human rights is uh, in many ways the most desirable kind of imperialism. So what would have happened if the United States had not intervened in the Balkans? And what did the European nations learn from this war? I think that uh, today, uh, last two Bosnians would trying to find each other within the territory of the country, trying to kill each other. And in, in Brussels, in Paris, London, Moscow, they were still arguing about, yeah, but I'm not quite sure how, how is the way to approach the problem and things like that. And most probably today in the afternoon, uh, that four last would catch the last one and then the war would theoretically be over. I mean, somehow, you know, these days. If the Bosnian wars were to begin again, or if Kosovo uh, were to blow up again, I think there is next to nothing that the European Union could credibly do to stop it. Nothing has really changed in the past 10 years. Europe is still a military pygmy, and even although certain European countries have military capabilities, they're almost wholly incapable of pulling those into any common European force. So one of the things that completely hasn't been solved in the past decade is the Balkan question. It's been put into cold storage, uh, but it seems to me quite easy to imagine a recurrence, particularly in Kosovo, uh, of the problems we saw in the 90s. And at that point, you can be sure that after three or four years of dithering, it'll be once again a case of turn to Uncle Sam for help. The Europeans have, have uh, said for uh, several years, uh, for at least the last five years, their intent, uh, their determination to create a, a European strike force, a, a U European only force that can take action without the United States. The problem with the European strike force is that uh, in Europe you're dealing with a generation of Europeans who have been become used to U.S. military forces as being the backbone for their defense. And they have allowed military spending and the development of military forces and the willingness to serve in the military to really seriously deteriorate. Europe is, is very afraid of, of a next war, a next big war, you know, because Europe has been involved in, in two big wars and, you know, it was, it was all a mess in Europe. I think um, especially the Germans are afraid of what could happen if, you know, if we interfere and in, they might fight back and what happens then? So, and, and that's why um, maybe we can't fight back because if we would try, if we would, would try to do anything, where we have nothing to do with. You know, the public would, ah, oh, stop it, stop it, we can't, we can't, you know, so. I think there is an enormous resistance to the idea of a collective European defence capability, most particularly in Britain. And even the French and Germans, who've gone the furthest down this route, have so far done nothing other than produce a kind of token force. It isn't actually capable of any serious military activity. Part of the problem is that the European Union is not the United States of Europe. It's an economic union which pulls in quite a limited way the sovereignty of some very strong nation states with a very great deal of history behind them. My worry is that you could have the United States withdrawing into isolation and nobody stepping into the breach. 
And then the whole world could end up being like the Balkans in the 1990s. The issue of humanitarian intervention is really a, a late 20th century phenomenon. It comes after the end of the Cold War. Once the Soviet Union goes away, and the United States is this unipolar military power, they have not only the ability to intervene militarily, and some people will say they have the responsibility to intervene. The term never again, in other words, the, the world community should never again stand aside and let a country murder its population. America i tekako treba da se umiješa u tuđe poslove. Znači, ako je ova jači i nauružan, treba ovoga što nema ubiti i gnjaviti i terorizam vršiti, terorizati taj narod koji nije nauružan. Americans always sort of give part of a possible solution of a problem to Europeans. But they are not quite able to get together. They cannot find a common statement, they cannot find a common policy. And that's why United States is sort of invited to come and to say, okay, I mean, we saw you cannot solve the problem. That's why we have to do it. It's always pleasant to hear, negotiate your way out, do it peacefully. In cases, it doesn't work. It simply doesn't work. And you're gonna to have to look at alternate means. We see when a country becomes threatening, totalitarian, brutal, that we've got to think about doing something about it. That our passiveness in the face of Pol Pot of Cambodia led to perhaps two million deaths out of eight million people. Our passiveness in Rwanda probably led to the death of 800,000 people. Had we intervened in some way, you might have reduced those numbers. We didn't, we didn't. We invade sovereign nations, we topple governments, we manipulate economies because they don't serve our needs. And because we are the one and only military superpower, who is going to challenge us? At the present time, the U.S. has military bases in over 90 countries, including Tajikistan and uh, oh, uh, Djibouti. I wonder how many fuel cell factories we could build here in America with the money we spend to maintain those remote bases. And even with half of our current military budget, we are still the strongest nation on earth. I tell my critics we are not running away, we're simply being realistic about our needs. Major combat operations in Iraq have ended. In the Battle of Iraq, the United States and our allies have prevailed. Where freedom takes hold, hatred gives way to hope. When freedom takes hold, men and women turn to the peaceful pursuit of a better life. American values and American interests lead in the same direction. We stand for human liberty. The United States is the superpower of the world today because the United States cares. We're not only interested in our own national concerns and in protecting our own national interests, we care ethically and morally. We, we care about democracy, we care about freedom. Promoting democracy might be true in the case of Iraq. However, the Middle East is full of kings, emirs, sultans and sheikhs who regard the countries as their personal property. The United States has a long history of supporting many of them. 
it's a more or less like a, a hypocrisy. They don't care much about democracy or uh, liberty or what people are doing and, and so on. They worry about is, is there an interest in this region or not? Um, uh, what would I get from this? If it's in our interest, the companies, the oil companies and so on, we'll do it. If America were in the Middle East for oil, there would be nothing new about that. Throughout history, all empires conquered territories in order to control their resources. Some would argue that the same thing happens today. Petrol is the most strategic resource, and the US is by far the largest consumer. We'll have a look at one of the most oil-rich countries in the world, a small country that, like many others, was conquered for its wealth. In Kuwait here, we never thought we had an enemy, because we're always a peace-loving The reason Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait was oil. If Kuwait was an agricultural country, he wouldn't come near us. To him, it was simple greed, and we thought as Kuwaitis that once Saddam did the invasion, that all the other countries will start to come to our rescue. And this was the sad awakening. They didn't. As a matter of fact, some of them took sides with Saddam. The alternative was to go to a superpower. The United States was the alternative. In 1991, the United States, together with a coalition of nations, drove Iraq out of Kuwait. Today, Kuwait has almost no military of its own and thousands of American troops on its soil. Does that mean that their oil is plundered? You know we're riding in time Just like a millionaire Just buy those houses and cars Or acting like movie stars Just let these good times roll So, education became free. School, as I said, up to university, even up to doctorate degree. There's no taxes. And every Kuwaiti family is entitled to apply for either a piece of land or a house. Former subjects of the British Empire, now many Kuwaitis live better than many Americans. They benefit from the first empire in history that actually pays for the resource they consume. When the price of petrol goes up, the US taxpayers, the funders of the Kuwaiti liberation, pay more, just like everybody else. It's not a matter of oil. Americans did not come here just for oil. They can get oil, you know, cheaply from uh, Saddam Hussein. He offered them to sell, you know, a barrel of oil for less than $10. So it is not a matter only of oil when the American came here to liberate us from Saddam Hussein. Kuwait was in fact just the first step of Hussein's master plan. Saudi Arabia was next on the list. Together, the three countries would concentrate over 40% of the global oil production in the hands of one man. Knowing that there was only one country that could swiftly prevent his plan, a backdoor bribe was offered. Oil at $10 a barrel, as long as Hussein was alive. In the life of a nation, we're called upon to define who we are and what we believe. But today, as president, I ask for your support in the decision I've made to stand up for what's right and condemn what's wrong, all in the cause of peace. In my direction, elements of the 82nd Airborne Division, as well as key units of the United States Air Force, are arriving today to take up defensive positions in Saudi Arabia. The acquisition of territory by force is unacceptable. No one, friend or foe, should doubt our desire for peace, and no one 
should underestimate our determination to confront aggression. However, Kuwaitis represent only one million people out of the half a billion in the Arab world. Next, we'll have a look at the largest Arab nation and one that has not been blessed with petrol revenues. This is Egypt. Behind the glorious past and the world-famed attractions lies a troubled country. The population has doubled in the last 30 years, but only 5% of the land is usable. The majority of rural females are illiterate, while a small privileged class controls most of the economy. There is some oil in Egypt, but it barely covers the country's own demand. Unlike Kuwait, there is no free housing, medical care, or education from the government. Sadly, this is the state of most Arab countries. While they share the same language, customs, and religion, the differences in development are tremendous. Could this be the cause of all the turmoil in the region? Well, I have argued that the problem in the Middle East isn't a clash of civilizations. It's a civilization of clashes uh, in the sense that there is a culture there uh, of political violence uh, that is deeply inimical to the emergence of uh, civil society and democracy of the sort that we know uh, in the West. So you have the Islamists of various kinds on, one, uh, on the one level. On the other uh, side, you have the dictatorships, the authoritarian dictatorships. And there hasn't been enough of an opportunity for the development of a, uh, of a moderate middle. Especially after the invasion of, of Saddam and so on, uh, people worry about uh, what our neighbor is going to do uh, in the future. Before, maybe you could live within the boundaries of your wall, you build it high enough, you lock the door, you're safe. But when people start to learn how to jump into, inside your house or blow the wall to come inside, then it becomes a different deal. Uh, you cannot live in seclusion anymore. Everybody is uh, under a threat of some sort or the other from his neighbor. We know we are a defenseless nation, we're a peaceful nation, we're a small nation in a bad neighborhood, in gigantic bad neighborhood. In Iran, unfortunately, at this time, uh, is, is a danger, you know, why does Iran want to have nuclear power? Why does Iran want to go against the rest of the world when it comes to its nuclear program? Could the world be wrong and Iran is right? In order to be fair, in order to please the people of this region, you have to tell the Israelis probably to, to, to leave the, uh, at least part of the region that they uh, occupied. Uh, look at the wall, for instance, that the Israelis are building now and, and kicking some people out of their land. What are the Americans doing? The only occupation in the world now, anywhere in the world, the only occupied land is the Palestinian land, and that's not fair. And America has to do something about it. I realize how dear Israel is to the, you know, an American's heart and how the whole culture evolves when it comes to foreign policy to protecting Israel. But you cannot just run the world the way you like it to be. And as a friend of America, I think that it's time for America to address such a, a, a coral issue. While the Middle East is a powder keg, none of these countries pose a direct threat to the United States, which still has to pay the full price of petrol. In 2009, by open bid, the Iraqi government divided the lucrative Halfaya oil field between China's National Petroleum Exploration Corporation, Total of France, and Petronas of Malaysia. Schlumberger, the German oil giant, was also awarded a multi-million dollar West Corner exploration deal. None of these countries sent any troops to Iraq to fight insurgents. American and UK firms have been awarded a minority of oil contracts with no preferential treatment. Oil is the point why the Americans start the war. 
in Iraq. And it is the oil that, uh, are pe that people are get killed for over there. We know that oil is a real problem for us. We have to stay at peace with countries who, are in who have oil uh, resources. You can't put your sons into and your kids into war for oil. You should, uh, you sh I mean, you should use your head and, um, for example, make solar energies and all that stuff working. In fact, most Middle Eastern oil does not come to the United States. It goes to China, Japan and the European countries that have almost no production of their own. Europeans have a long history of hypocrisy when it comes to the Middle East. The Europeans need stability in the Middle East. They're as dependent, indeed more dependent, on Middle Eastern oil than the United States. But they don't want, uh, at least uh, they don't all want, to pay the quite heavy price of trying to stabilize that region. So when Europeans bleat about American policy in the Middle East, you need to take it with a large grain of salt. And frankly, they don't see a threat to Middle East oil resources. The Europeans, I think, uh, would like to do work in the Middle East as a business proposition. They're not considering uh, the democratizing of regimes uh, throughout the Middle East, as the United States is doing. Uh, they'd much rather try to hold the lid on and, uh, and just see the Middle East as a source of oil, I think. Even more dependent on Arab oil are the Asian countries. Japan and China are the two largest importers. However, none of them has any involvement in the region. Soon after the Second World War, Japanese emperor went to Japanese diet, which is a Japanese parliament, and gave a speech that from now on, Japan must be a pacifist country, heiwa kokka, or peace-oriented country. And Japanese public learned that they shouldn't opt for war, but peace. China is in the midst of a really vast transformation in its dependence on oil. Twenty or so years ago, China was an oil exporter. Uh, within the next 20 years, they're going to be a massive oil importer. China is going to be very sensitive to where their oil comes from and how assured that supply is going to be. It looks like they cannot do but rely overwhelmingly in the Middle East. To get Middle East oil, they need to be assured that the sea lines of communication with the Middle East are open. Right now, the sea lines of communication are open because of U.S. naval power. We don't think that it's fair for us to just, you know, keep the oil flow going and the rest of the world is just sitting idle and buying oil and not doing anything about keeping the stability and the peace in this region. Therefore, we think that it is, it is a must for America and the rest of the world to really interfere in this region to keep the stability and peace so as the oil could keep on flowing. So if the United States is not the main beneficiary of the Middle Eastern oil, how long will they continue alone to pay the price of involvement? Let me uh, say that what the United States is doing like an antibiotic. You cannot live on antibiotic for, for life or for good. You have to let these societies settle down, solve their differences and so on. You cannot keep this external factor uh, for, 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 for good. Uh, for instance, if a society, like the Iraqi society now, we're saying that the moment the, the Americans would withdraw, maybe things would look worse. Maybe things would be worse for some time. But then the, the leaders of the Iraqi society or community would sit down and say, enough is enough, like what happened in Lebanon, for instance. You cannot go on with, with civil war for good. You cannot uh, stay there and say we are we are there to protect the world because you are there. You are you are uh, spending money. You are uh, your own soldiers or, or or children are 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 dying every day, and people are not very happy with you. It doesn't make sense.
That's what Europeans need to worry about. Take away the United States and there's really no way of knowing what's going to happen. If there were no American commitment to the Middle East, uh, if there had never been an American commitment to the Middle East, there would be no State of Israel. I think that's the first and most obvious point. It's very, very hard to imagine such a small state with so few assets surviving without American support. So you'd have to say goodbye to that. Israel has a Sooner or later, Israel's enemies, including the current regime in Iran, would be able to wage a war against it that the Israelis would only be able to win at a colossally high price. So that's number one. Number two is what would the various states in that region do to one another absent the United States? We know that Saddam was capable of waging war against two of his neighbors uh, because he not only invaded Kuwait, but before that he went to war against Iran. We know that Lebanon was ripped apart by its neighbors and turned into a puppet state uh, by Syria. The list goes on and on. And if you take away the United States from this story, it seems to me you don't just have the destruction of Israel, but you then have the self-destruction uh, of the Arab world. It's a very, very volatile part of the world, and it seems to me that those who blame the problems of the Middle East on the United States or on the colonizers before the United States are completely missing the point. <laughs> The next regional superpower in the Middle East is clearly Iran. Iran is the principal beneficiary of America's generous destruction of its principal rival, Saddam Hussein's Iran. And I think the ambitions of Iran for regional dominance are to be underestimated at our peril. That's why it's so important that Iran not acquire nuclear weapons, because I think with nuclear weapons it would be North Korea, but North Korea poised on top of some of the biggest oil reserves in the world. One day, this very flag will fly over the parliament in London. We will see this flag that will fly over the White House, and we will see the Black House, the Kaaba, will take over the whole world. <laughs> Just imagine that those groups, Al-Qaeda for example, take over the power in any country in Saudi Arabia or trying to threaten the situation and the security in the Gulf. So I'm sure that will threaten that you know, flow of oil or export of oil to Western countries. But America cannot now withdraw from Iraq until they fix Iraq. Because if Iraq is not brought to stability and to democracy, then it will be anarchy. And this anarchy would spill all over the region. And I'm not exaggerating if I say all over the world. An interruption in Middle East oil production and flow uh, would have immediate severe economic dislocation throughout the world. Well, the economy in every level will be affected. Our allies in Europe would be the first to suffer, but certainly the Asians would suffer, particularly Japan right now, and the future China as well. And we don't understand that this is a globalized economy. 
So you can't sit there and say, oh, you guys have got problems. We can avoid it. We can't because oil is an international market and it doesn't really matter where your oil is from. But if the biggest oil center isn't producing, everybody suffers. We left the Middle East without an answer. What are America's options? Will it stay involved? And at what cost? Operation Iraqi Freedom took over 5,000 American lives. Future conflicts could be a lot worse. And what would be the alternative? Another world war? Another depression? It happened in the past. America emerged stronger than before. And the people. What would happen to them? Is it right to police the Balkans but leave the Middle East? Well, I think the problem is pretty simple. For over 200 years, the people of the world, they looked up to us, the United States of America. And that meant something. We were this great hope of democracy, of freedom. And today, things are a bit different. In fact, they're the opposite. We've had a bit of an image change. People, they dislike us, they, they even hate us. Why? Because we impose our will on other countries using our military might. Why are we spending your hard-earned tax dollars to support countries like Germany, Japan, South Korea, whose economies are some of the strongest in the world? Why are you paying for their defense? They can afford militaries of their own. For over 60 years, we have opened our markets to them and provided them with free defense. Enough is enough. You know, many people in those countries live better than many Americans. If you elect me as your next president, I will take the savings from our $420 billion annual defense budget and I will create new jobs. And together, we will build the foundation for a better, stronger America. The wars of Asia have been over for more than 50 years. Today, old enemies have become best trading partners. While the 20th century has been known as the American century, the next one will probably belong to Asia. Despite all the peace and prosperity, there are a lot of American troops and commitments in this region. We set out to find out why. 그러나 난 믿습니다. 우리들이 두 배, 세 배, 더 힘을 내어 일한다면 모두가 부러워하는 공산주의 미상천이 우리 마을에도 일떠서리라고 말입니다. 자, 저도 뭔가 힘들어하는 것 덮고 싶군요. 고맙소, 네 양도. 일을 그 1995년 말부터 일을 시작했었어요. 그런데 한 달을 일하게 되면 내가 그내 인건비로서 받을 수 있는 돈이 당시 북한 돈 70원이었어요. 그런데 그 70원으로서 살수 있는 물건은 쌀반 킬로 
값밖에 안 돼요. 제가 떠날 당시에 우리 집에는 모든 재산과 식량이 그 식량과 바꿔 먹을 수 있는 것들이 전부 다 팔려 나갔고 더 이상 식량과 바꿔 먹을 수 있는 재산이 없었, 없었어요. 그래서 먹고 살기 위해서 탈북하게 됐어요. 처음에는 제가 중국으로 가겠다 했을 때 그걸 이 모든 걸 아니까 잡 탈출을 하다 잡히면 그 정치범 수용소로 가는 거 알기 때문에 반대했었어요. 잡히게 되면 정치범 수용소라는 감옥으로 가, 가게 돼요. 그런데 이 정치범 수용소라는 감옥은 다른 일반 감옥과 달라서 그 어, 석방이라는 개념이 없어요. 우리 아저씨가 외국에서 편지했었는데. 구나라는 별나게 본적가 안돼 어떻게 내가 살아있는 동안 온갖 향락을 다 누려야지 이야 왜 점점 구리대 갈까 참 한심하지 희생된 혁명선열들이 지금 살아있었으면 뭐라고 했을까 그래서 넘어올 때 만약 잡히게 되면 자살할 걸 각오하고 넘어갔죠 저뿐만 아니라 많은 사람들이 다 그래요 어머니가 의사였어요. 잡히게 된몸 안에 있는 모든 그 자살할 수 있는 도구를 뺏기잖아요. 그 때문에 어머니, 어머니로부터 도구 없이 죽는 방법을 배웠어요. 그 양, 이렇게 그 머리로 올라가는 양쪽 동맥을 동시에 누르게 되면 사람이 죽게 돼요. 고통 없이 죽게 돼요. 그 방법을 배우고 나왔어요. 어머니한테서. 지금 북한에 저희 어머니와 누나들이 있어요. 그래서 만약 저희 얼굴을 북한 쪽에서 이 방송을 봐서 그 나라는 사람이 남한에 와 있다는 걸 알면 집안에 추방이 돼요. 정치범 수용소로 끌려갈 수도 있고 극심한 경우에는 정치범 수용소로 끌려갈 수 있고 경한 경우에는 감옥으로 가야, 가, 가야 돼요. 모든 타국자들이 바라는 것은 미국이 북한에 대해서 그 무력으로 공격해서 김정일 정권을 제거해 주기를 확수하려고 바래요. 백성들은 저항 안 해요. 왜냐하면 이제 북한 백성들은 다 알거든요. 김정일 정권이 나쁜 정권이라는 걸 알기 때문에 김정일 정권이 허물어지길 바라기 때문에 저항 안 해요. The regime in North Korea is the craziest in the world. It's the least predictable in the world. It's probably the most unstable in the world. And nobody knows what's going to happen next. It could collapse tomorrow. It could go to war tomorrow. It could wipe Seoul off the face of the earth tomorrow. In that sense, there's no bigger threat to global security than North Korea. They've made numerous incursions across the demilitarized zone. They've made attempts to assassinate and been successful. in uh, killing many South Koreans at various locations around the world. He blew up half their cabinet in Rangoon in 1983. He sabotaged 
K858 in 1987 with 115 South Koreans on it. He sent down assassination teams to take out the president. These are violent people. While the menacing North sounds impressive, South Korea is twice as big in terms of population and their economy is 20 times larger. More than that, they benefit from the latest American weapons and they seem very motivated to preserve their way of life. So why can't they defend themselves? ゲリラ部でまん、30万人で国内全般にゲリラ部で、北韓の特殊部で。いろんな人で一時攻撃をかけてみん、韓国があまり若干の存在を持っていないと、これは難しいです。ソウルを準備して訓練をして特殊目的部隊を持っている方が最初の一日で相手の半分以上を壊滅することができるという。韓国の威力が非常に強いです。非常に危険です。The American presence is a deterrence to North Korean adventurist action. It's worked since 53, which is roughly 52 years, so I would say that's a test that it works. If the United States were to pull out from the Northeast arena and leave the region entirely in the hands of China, Japan, and, and Korea, I foresee a great chaos. Looking at all the regimes the United States has removed, one wonders why Washington has left such a government in power for so long. In 1968, it captured the US Navy boat Pueblo and imprisoned its crew for a year. It has allegedly built a nuclear weapon and starved millions of its own citizens in the process. While the experts debate the effectiveness of the North Korean atomic bomb, Pyongyang is counting on another strategic asset, a treaty of alliance with China. In North Korea, China has a wonderful bargaining counter. It's impossible for the United States to solve the problem of North Korea without China. It's been tried and it hasn't worked. You can't really keep the Chinese out of the equation because the Chinese keep that regime teetering on the brink of collapse, but not quite collapsing. The most interesting question in the world today is what will China do with its increasing economic power? It's an extraordinarily explosive question because when one thinks back to the 1930s, in many ways World War II began with the Japanese invasion of China, not in Europe. Well, I don't think China is content as simply a regional power. China believes that it deserves to be on par with the United States. Uh, the long-term goal uh, for the Chinese leadership is to become a dominant power in the region. You know? And as a matter of fact, they said it in public that the long-term goal, strategic goal, is to eject the U.S. influence from the Asia-Pacific region. Well, China is developing the capability to launch uh, ICBMs against the United States, uh, the same capability Russia had during the Cold War. 
next five to ten years, uh, they'll have a new missile called the DF-31A, which will be able to hit anywhere in the United States with nuclear weapons. This is a new uh, phenomenon, something that the Americans don't seem to notice. Uh, I don't know why we don't pay attention to it, but it's a serious matter. Containing China's rise might be the real reason for the American presence in Asia. Could Washington believe that they will never have to share the world with another superpower? After all, China is reforming, and the small Asian countries are a lot closer to Shanghai than to Los Angeles. But do these countries want to be shared? Only a hundred miles across the sea, there is an island where the other Chinese live. The ones that don't have to answer to the Beijing government. The economy flourishes, the people have rights and freedoms. This is Taiwan. Sometime in the 30s, there was a split in China's leadership. Despite the American support, nationalist leader Chiang Kai-shek could not effectively resist the Japanese occupation. Four years after the Japanese surrender of 1945, after a bloody civil war, communist leader Mao Zedong took control of the country while his archenemy took refuge in Taiwan. The United States continued to support him with weapons in the hope that one day he would retake China from the communists. He never did. After his death, Taiwan became one of Asia's thriving democracies and a prosperous country. China has claimed Taiwan to be part of China, even though Taiwan has been part of the Chinese rule only four years of the past century. We believe China wants to forcefully take over Taiwan, wants to incorporate Taiwan as part of their expansionary intentions. This is something that we cannot accept. We worked very hard to build democracy in this country. Many of our party leaders uh, sacrificed tremendously, spending time in prison family members being murdered, um, people being exiled uh, to fight for the basic freedoms that we have here in Taiwan. And we will not easily give that up. If China took Taiwan, it's a great opportunity. Uh, China could put military bases on Taiwan. They can absorb the military know-how. Uh, China could absorb the technology that they've developed here and use it. The most likely scenario that is being discussed at this time is something called a decapitation strike in which uh, t uh, Chinese special forces uh, along with uh, pro-China elements in the military here and political elements take the capital of Taipei first and then bring in a pro-China leader, swear him in and uh, declare Taiwan a part of China. We visited a Taiwanese naval base. The superior staff assured us how ready they are to fight for their country. We have also seen three out of the four Taiwanese diesel submarines, one of them American-made, a World War II edition. While there is no doubt that this nation is determined to fight, is determination enough? Even with US arms, our calculation is that we cannot defend ourselves more than two weeks. The Chinese are quite capable of taking Taiwan. They're really gearing up right now for the United States military. That's what they're gearing up for. That's why they're buying all these ships and building all these planes. They're not doing it because of the Taiwan military. They can take Taiwan. We don't have any military troops in Taiwan, by the way. We don't have any military treaty. We have the Taiwan Relations Act, which in effect says that we would help Taiwan defend itself in case of attack. 
and I, we take it seriously. If America said tomorrow we're not going to support Taiwan anymore, China would just take it. Uh, the thing that stops China from taking Taiwan is the United States Navy, and that's it. If the United States comes in, what happens then? Then you're looking at a potential nuclear war. That's why I think Taiwan is really the nearest thing we have to the causes of a world war today. We hope this won't happen, um, but uh, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, after all, China is a nuclear power, and Taiwan isn't. We're against the development of uh, weapons of mass destruction. What the United States does about Taiwan is in many ways the big strategic decision. In many ways, the safest thing would be to sell Taiwan down the river, to make sure that there never is a moment when the United States has to go to full-scale war against China over Taiwan, an island that many Americans would struggle to find on a map. We hope a confrontation will never take place. Um, Taiwanese are not expecting the Americans to engage in a war for Taiwan. We're not expecting that. But we're expecting the Americans to be strong and present in this region so that a war won't have to happen. For the moment, the U.S. military is still strong and present. A thousand miles across the sea is the home of the U.S. 7th Fleet, the mightiest fleet in Asia. A friendless nation in the aftermath of World War II, Japan renounced militarism, but it could not remain defenseless. By 1960, from an occupied country, Japan became a U.S. ally. While small Taiwan could never rival China in military spending, Japan is the third largest economy in the world and one of the most technologically advanced countries. Why is America paying for their defense? When you look at the opinion poll, you would be amazed how much Japanese public trust U.S. presence here. It has been consistently above 70% support. Why do you think we have such a high support? While the Japanese spend less than 1% of their GDP on their defense, the U.S. taxpayers fund the upkeep of three army, three air force, four navy, and 13 marine bases on Japanese soil. When asked to help in Iraq, Japan sent only 600 soldiers, and even those were not allowed to engage in combat. Japan has got a very good navy and a very good air force using our aircraft, I believe it's the F-15. And they're good pilots and they're good seamen. They call themselves the self-defense forces, but they have a huge navy. And they have Aegis-class destroyers. Uh, they have some of the most advanced fighters in the world, fighter jets. So. Japan can take care of itself in many ways. So. Indeed, Japan has a lot of modern weapons, with the exception of one. Affected by the tragedy of World War II, Japan vowed never to possess nuclear weapons and even sought the abolition of such means of destruction from the world. So what would happen should the United States leave this alliance and bring home the 50,000 troops it currently devotes to the defense of Japan? If U.S. Uh, abruptly uh, withdraws the military presence from uh, the Japanese islands, then we'll spend the next 10 years rearming in a very serious way, uh, suddenly including acquiring nuclear capability. But if the Koreans have nuclear weapons, the Chinese already have nuclear weapons, the Russians who are in the region have nuclear weapons, the Japanese are not remaining non-nuclear. If Japanese go nuclear, do you think the Chinese can put up with that? Japanese attitude to China has turned sour and it works vice versa. Chinese public has turned sour to Japan. Japan is different from Germany. Japan did not really show any remorse of its 
past the aggression against the Asian countries. Japan has expressed its remorse to China many times over. Our emperor and empress visited China and expressed their remorse. I don't like you know, the, the Japanese to be rearmed. Before they really apologize to us uh, to show their sincere remorse. China replaced communism with patriotism, and Japan is a very easy target. まあ、ある程度介入、あれ口出しをしても、いいかな、大丈夫かなと思うようなところが中国にはまだあります。これは古い彼らの思想が外交的な手法についても少し日本人はついてきなさいというスタイルは、やっぱり日本ではあまり受
They have that choice, or they can opt out. They can walk away. They did that before, when the American empire last imploded after the First World War. The results were not pretty. And my hope is that that won't be tried again, and that Americans will accept that unpopular though it may make them, wielding power is on balance preferable to running away from it.